Hello everybody and welcome to this, the latest episode of the Rewatch Project with Hannah and Mike. I am Mike and with me as always is Hannah. How are you this Sunday evening, Hannah? Oh, fabulous. Ready for some um, Twin Peaks? Very ready for some Twin Peaks after the longest day in the history of the world. Well, the, 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 the hours changed here in New Zealand, so it's it's dark early. We're moving into autumn as the rest of the world, well, mo- moving into winter as yep. the uh, rest of the, uh, the world. Uh, or a large part of the rest of the world moves into summer. Autumn, winter is my vibe. Yeah. Um, It's my favourite time of year. Um, It's the right kind of weather for me. I like it being dark when I go to bed. Yeah. Yeah. And it's good to impeach watching uh, season Very much, very much good to impeach. So it seems uh, appropriate. Um, We'll, um, quick bit of housekeeping before we get into that. And I should point out, this is the third recording I'm doing today. Um, so, uh, well, the only uh, you say that like it's it's some kind of like, um, oh fuck, I've already f- lost my words already. It's all right, we can edit it. Um, like it's some a kind burden? of yes, like it's a no, I'm saying it like it's a badge of honor. I'm like, I'm, oh. I'm like pumping out content today, yeah, it is, it is podcasting Sunday, yeah, yeah, and I've you know, I've, I've and both of the other things that I've done, I have edited and put out. So I've put out two videos, one bit of audio content. And uh, um, if anyone has listened to the Chin Stroker versus Punter episode um, about talking about Purple Rain, the one thing you forgot to say regarding what I thought about it is that Prince is the worst on screen kisser I have ever seen. Well, you've obviously never seen any of my movies. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not looking at you when I'm kissing you. I've got my eyes shut. Well, let's just move past that, shall we? <laughs> uh, we just want to address that. Um, but yes, so please do check out those. Do you oh, keep your eyes open? <laughs> yeah, why? Like weirdly wide. <laughs> I'm, I'm a starer. Um, but no, do check out those. Check out uh, also our friends' podcast. So Nate, the aforementioned two stroker versus punter. Um, his film, her movie, Film Bastards, um, Entertainment Landfill, which is back, I'm glad to say. Mm-hmm. Um, they're doing a, uh, it's a, a sort of spin-off series, which is, uh, it's it's a, the NIM movie club mm-hmm. uh, that Jason's doing. Perfect. So check that out. Uh, also check out The Good, The Bad and The Odd and the Talk With Everything podcast and uh, and also send us feedback at rewatchprojectpodcast at gmail.com. You can also comment on our YouTube channel and we will read those out as feedback as well. Uh, we are on Instagram and Twitter, where in both cases we are at Rewatch Proj. That's Rewatch P R O J. And we also very much appreciate uh, five star reviews on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify. That makes a real difference to um, increasing the likelihood of people stumbling across the show, oh, yeah. which is a great way of getting new listeners. And what that results in ultimately is more feedback, which is a great motivator to record more frequently and do more stuff and can be quite an infusing element. So please do one or all of those things. But if you can only do one, email at uh, rewatchprojectpodcast at gmail.com or comments on the YouTube channel are very much appreciated. So Hannah, in the spirit of that, do we have any feedback on this episode? Do you want me to talk about what we're talking about tonight first? You know what? That would be probably traditional, wouldn't it? Yes, um, it would. Okay. Um, so um, yes, please do. So you're not the only person who's allowed to mess up. <laughs> That's good. We're a democracy. Um, okay. So tonight's episode is called Slaves and Masters. The synopsis says the police look for James in the Marsh murder. Boppy... Boppy? Can I just Boppy? say as well, you sounded really Aussie there. Marsh murder? <laughs> the marsh murder. <laughs> <laughs> Bobby and Shelley tell Truman that... Shello. <laughs> Bobbo. <laughs> Leo. <laughs> Stop, because I've got to say Leo next. <laughs> uh, Leo. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Let me start that again. Bobby and Shelley tell Truman. Truman. Trumo. <laughs> Harrow. That's the reason you and I are married. <laughs> Bobby and Shelley tell Truman that Leo escaped, and Bobby reveals that he saw Hanko <laughs> shoot Leo the through night- the window. <laughs> He was through the window. I mean, that's, a, that's just accurate. 
this has got <laughs> this has got an absolute vibe of Ace Mace. Oh god, yeah. <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. I can't believe I was thinking about this not too long ago. That when they went to space. We didn't talk about that. <laughs> How did we miss the... Uh... <laughs> space is on the case in space. <laughs> it was staring us in the face. <laughs> oh, Sorry, carry on. Okay. Uh, oh, God. Bobby reveals that he saw Hank shoot Leo the night that Mill burned. Albert returns to Twin Peaks with information. Alberto! <laughs> <laughs> on Wyndham Earl Oaks. Um, window. window. Back to the window again. Oh, this is going well. It's, uh, I'm, even, I'm, I'm drinking fizzy water, <laughs> yeah, by the way, yeah. and I'm drinking tea, just yeah, so you know. Neither of us have had a drop of alcohol. Yeah, I mean. It's directed by Keto, <laughs> Diane Keaton. <laughs> oh, wow. The Diane Keaton, isn't the it? The Diane well? Keaton. And written by Harley Payton okay. and Robert Ingalls. Uh, I think we should hand over now to the one bit of feedback we have. Is it Marco? <laughs> it is Marco. <laughs> it is Marco, um, who has provided us with some uh, audio yeah. content. I think we should do, do Mark the uh, the honour, well, not the honour, sorry, give him the, the correct res- respects and say that this is Mark from The Good, The Bad and The Odd. Indeed. Podcast. Um, and the Twin Peaks log. Yes. Hi, Mike. Hi, Hannah. It is I, Mark. Uh, I thought I'd send you some feedback. You've been asking for it, and I was kind of waiting for this current, sort of slightly lightweight phase of Twin Peaks to finish, and I thought I'd uh, jump in there so I could talk about the phase you've just talked about and, and, and some f- stuff about the phase to come. First things first, let me tell you where my personal rewatchings have got to, which I tend to do, even though you've never asked for it. Um, I am on the new Doctor Who now. I finished the entire classic run, had a great time with that. I'm uh, part way through Tenants run, so I've watched the Eccleston, watched Tenants, watched the amazing and rather wonderful episode, Runaway Bride. A really great episode, that one. Uh, Christmas episode, I really enjoyed that one. David Tennant and Catherine Tate are just off the hook, actually. Um, I'm starting to think that Donna might be my favourite assistant or companion or whatever you call it. Really good. Also on Doctor Who, I'm really enjoying your uh, your um, Doctor Who perspective from a Trekkie uh, videos, Mike. I think they're excellent. I'm really looking forward to getting to the Aztecs because that's got some important stuff here about should you try and change where you're at and those sorts of issues. There's also what uh, an- another story coming up. Um, that I always really enjoy, and I think it's important, though it's often considered as a minor one, called The Meddling Monk. Um, first time we meet another Time Lord, in fact. And I'm not sure in the story if he's considered a Time Lord, but certainly in Retcon he is considered a renegade Time Lord. He's referred to as The Meddling Monk, The Monk. There's Apparently there's a female version in the extended universe called The Nun, um, and he's also referred to by the Doctor in other stories as The Time Meddler. So he is a significant character. We haven't seen in a while, but he is a significant character. Um, I finished Buffy. I watched all seven seasons Yay. of Buffy in the end. Yeah, Spike's the most interesting character. I think I said I think he might be uh, earlier. But yeah, man, the stuff with Spike and Buffy is just off the hook. I think five and six are the best seasons. Seven, it fell down a bit. It didn't pick up all the pieces quite as well as it could have, but it was still pretty decent. And the best thing about it, I think, was the Spike Buffy stuff going on, what Spike's going through. Um, like their, their relationship is really cool and I think interesting. And it, it's thrown into sharp relief whenever Buffy meets Angel again and how kind of teen romancy Angel and Buffy are. Uh, yeah, Angel and Buffy are compared to Spike and Buffy. Well, point, Spike and Buffy it? feels He's much younger. more sordy and twisted and and um, interested, actually, uh, to put a <laughs> like that. Um, so I really enjoyed that. Uh, I'm really pleased with your X-Files rewatching. Man, you guys are motoring through it. Um, uh, one show you might want to try and watch to finish the X-Files, uh, and also, before we are, move off of that, you really should be watching The Lone Gunman, in my opinion, but that's up to you. Um, Supernatural's that. worth a try. The Winchester Brothers stuff. Supernatural's really cool. I already watched season one, and I keep meaning to restart it and watch all 
20 seasons or whatever it is. But I really enjoy Supernatural and it feels very much in the X-Files space to think you dig it. Um, I am um, jump back on to my DS9 watching. I've just started season three. I really have not enjoyed season one and two that much. Season three opened with a, some, a real banger of a pair of episodes called, I think, The Search, uh, where we see the USS Defiant for the first time. That That's a cracked out ship. Uh, that's kind of interesting. And they had to do something. If, if the actual space station's in a station, you know, it's a sitting duck to any kind of attack, isn't it? They need some sort of heavy gun and the Defiant is there. And uh, so... I quite enjoyed the opening of season three, but we'll see what happens. Back to Twin Peaks, though. Twin Peaks, that's our main thing. Yeah, I'm, I've am i always liked the Dick and Andy show. You you know that, Mike, for sure. And I think that was kind of the best part of this whole phase, actually, the Dick and Andy show. Not enough of it, in my opinion. I also quite liked, and you kind of skipped over it. You, you weren't that bothered. Uh, was the You referred to it as the Jazzlyn. I call it Lana the Sex Witch stuff um i quite <laughs> no, like that and it's funny because that too. girl is is actually the lead lead female actress in cry kid 3 and i've only recently maybe in the last three or four years seen cry kid 3 and watched cobra kai through and so i it's funny seeing her younger than she is in london the sex witch in cry kid 3 and then seeing her as this and it, it kind of works it's she sells it that's good i also kind of like all the ben civil one nonsense the real nightmare one is James and Evelyn's story. It is like the needle drop equivalent of of, of, of a video story. It's so it just just taking stuff out of Twin Peaks and doing it somewhere else in a not very interesting story is just a bad idea and it just doesn't really work for me. Um, I did laugh at your last episode I listened to, which was the was it the the one that ends with. Um, no, it doesn't end. It end. Well, it starts with them discovering the body with pointing to the chest piece, that episode. Um, you did actually mention, oh, no, it's all killer from now on. I just wanted to remind you of some of the stuff coming up. Uh, without doing any spoilers, that's kind of made me know when you said it's all killer from now on. It's, firstly, it's Windermel's Master of Disguise stuff. Uh, <laughs> so one of them works when he talks to Donna in the library. Uh, I've got to be careful not to do too many stuff, but some of his disguises are proper goofy. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing all that. I also quite like all the Pine Weasel pageant stuff, especially when Dick Tremaine gets involved and sort of trying to sort of nurse everyone through. I also quite like the reoccurrence of the character and I can't remember his name. I don't think he's even given a name. We've seen him earlier in the show um, where he was trying to sell uh, sh for, for Leo's sort of problems, a harness. It was that guy. That sounds. Oh, yeah. He's Squiggy from the Lenny from Lenny and Squiggy from Laverne and Shirley, which dates me quite a bit. He <laughs> appears again, and he always makes me low. And I wish he was around a bit more actually in Twin Peaks, but it's kind of fun to see. Um, after remind you, someone gets turned into a doorknob. <laughs> I like yeah, that. I like okay. it. And. Yeah. Um, I also always laugh, laugh at the bit when uh, Cooper has a vision and the giants just say no, uh, and uh, kind of indicate <laughs> something bad's happening. And Cooper doesn't really take it on. It just always makes me laugh a bit. <laughs> I, will, I will say the next episode um, of the one that I've listened to, and you may have already covered this by the time you play this feedback, I don't know, but or you might be about to do it, is directed by Diane Keaton. I really enjoyed this episode. She's a great visual director in this one, and I, I really appreciate it. I always look forward to the Diane Keaton episode. Let's put it that way. Um, and it's kind of interesting to see. Um, that's really it from me. I'm really enjoying the show. I really enjoying the Dot Who video content you're doing, Mike. So keep up the good work. It's it's great. Uh, so I, I've gone through a lot. I hope I've not taken too much of everyone's time, but I will be still listening and jumping in here and there uh, and letting you know stuff uh, as certain things occur. But you'll have to wait and see. All right, then that's me. So bye from me. Thank you very much. Gosh, lots of chew on there. We've got all the time that you want to give us, yes. Mark, any time. So, so thank you so much. A couple of super quick things there. Uh, Deep Space Nine, yeah, season three is great. If you're still not into the show once you get a certain of the part of the way to season three, I just don't know what to tell you. Um, Buffy, 
Uh, he's I just, only just started season three. No, I know. That's what I'm saying. But if he gets away way into it and he's still oh, not okay. feeling it, then I don't know what to say. Um, Buffy, well, I do. Abandon it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Buffy, uh, I like season five and six, but I think season two and three are the strongest seasons for sure no. by far. Uh, season six for me is is the best. I, I think season six has got some of the best stuff, but for me it's just so inconsistent. Like You've got all that stuff with the three evil geeks and it spends a lot of time on that. And I just don't think that I think I think some of the highest points of the show are in that season. Um, I, I, I'm a bit of a defender of season seven as well. I like season seven, but um, but I'm glad that you like Buffy. I think that you know it's a crazy. It would be crazy if we didn't. And Supernatural. It's funny because the general consensus of Supernatural is it's the X Files meets Buffy. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, but I've never watched it, and I know it's it's one of those shows where I know I'd like it, but there's just so much of it, so much. Yeah, but. You know, you chip away at it and suddenly you've watched it yeah, all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we do like having a big watch, don't we? A hundred percent. I am so pleased to hear that you think Buffy and Spike are the best combination because I do too. Um, and and you're right, Buffy and Angel is teen romance versus Buffy and Spike's more emotional, meatier Well, romance. adult relate. I mean, Yeah, the, the, an adult relationship. I mean, the show says yeah. that is that... Yeah. Angel and Buffy were an idealised relationship in the mind of a naive girl, Yeah, really, you know. Yeah. And, you know, he turns evil when they consummate their relationship. And basically what that is a metaphor for, aside from just the fact that, you know, losing virginity can be traumatic. And the whole thing about, you know, guys can turn into douchebags as soon as they've got what they want. Yeah. is that metaphor as well. But also just the fact that Buffy grew up and realised and their relationship was never the same afterwards because she entered into the adult world and their relationship, it's like, you know. Movie love. Well, he was, he was a vampire. She was a vampire mm-hmm. slayer. You know, when you're all doughy-eyed, you're like, well, I don't care. Love is but when, Love will but, conquer Love will conquer. But then she became an adult. And ad, when you're an adult, you have to be pragmatic and go, okay, well, that's great. But how's this going to work? Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't think that it's uh, one's better or than the, the other, I think that those they serve different dramatic functions at a different point. But I would say that the clearly the Spike and Buffy relationship he has got more to it from a emotional complexity. But I think that the the power and the effect of the relationship that Angel and Buffy had was much more iconic and much more in keeping with what the show was at the time. And you can see that. You can see its influence on things like Twilight. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, and I, I think that, that actually had a real I don't think cultural... anyone's doubting the cultural significance it had or the influence it had on other things. It's just not the better relationship. Yeah, well, again, it, it's how, know, how are you measuring that, though? Are you talking better? On, on my opinion. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. how I'm measuring it. That, that's all I can measure it on. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's it's a much simpler, almost fairy tale kind of thing, um, and the, they. But I th- I think I think Spike understands Buffy far more oh, than yeah, Angel yeah, yeah. ever yeah, I mean, does. There's even ways you even, can even after they're together as a couple, Angel. I mean, at, like. There's a shorthand to Buffy and Spike's relationship that Angel and Buffy... Oh, yeah, no, I, I think we're having different conversations. So I'm not saying that one is a better relationship yeah. as far as, um, you know, the actual relationship itself. I'm just talking about them dramatically as devices within a story, you know, Um and I just think that they're trying to... Well, I'm talking to... about them as real people because, you know... Yeah, well, no, but I think that it's for different ways. That we're like, you're I get, much more... I get really offended by people who don't exist. Yeah, well, so, no, I mean, yeah. I, you're, I mean, I'll see that. Like, in, like in, in, I think, in the beginning of the last season of The X-Files, when, spoiler alert, when Mulder and Scully weren't together, I could mm-hmm. tell that you were irked by that. And I think it's because you watch things more emotionally, when I, whereas I tend to watch things... A little bit more mechanically, is it, for want yes. of a better word, you know. Yeah. Like I'll be watching it and thinking about the storytelling. And again, I'm not saying that that's better or cleverer no, or anything we, like that. But we do. You're like I fully agree with like, you. Like there are times we, when I'll be watching something and I can tell that you're being prickly about it, and I'm like, "This is great. What's your problem?" And then I'll be like, 
oh, it's because you don't like what they've done. You know, it's... Like, I'll be sitting there feeling fucked off that this person's decided this other person's no good or whatever, Mm. and you'll turn to me and you'll go, that was all one shot. And I think, who fucking cares if that was one shot? I'll show you one shot. shot. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But that, I like, I also think that's very much the difference between... A male and female view. Well, I think there is, and, and, I, 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 and I know how to, it sounds. I mean, I know that's stereotypical, but no, but yeah, but I know how it sounds when a man says to a woman that they're being emotional. But I think that often that's the case. In yeah. fact, that is the case. Yeah, and that's not to say that I, I mean, I, I, you, I, I'm, I'm a total pushover. You're like whenever there's an emotional scene in the film, Hannah will always be like, "Oh, you have a little cry, you have a little cry." <laughs> well, it, it's like when we were in the car. Um, the other morning and I burnt my lip on my cup of tea and you said, oh, do you want to pull over? Because I was driving at the time, listeners. And I said, no, no, I'm fine. I'm I'm not that much of a fanny. And you and I started laughing because the implication was that you absolutely <laughs> yeah, were that, that much was not of a lost fanny. On me. Um, but, but I do think it's interesting that, you, that, that we have those differences because I'll be, you'll be almost acting as though you think what you're watching is bad. Like, I'll be like, oh, I'm really surprised that Hannah's not liking this because it, it's good. It's re- it, it's a good story. It's well made. It's well performed. Mm. But then I realise that you that you have, ta- have taken almost personal offence yes. at the fact that the creators have dis- dis- decide to go a certain way with, with characters. Yeah. Um, and you're angry at the at the movie or the show or whatever it is that you're watching 100%. about that, you know. Yeah. And that's just endlessly fascinating to me, you know. I can take personal offence at something that's happened in a movie yeah. and hold it against actors who have nothing to do with anything <laughs> for years. Dear Die Hard, do you know yeah. Lethal Weapon? <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, uh, like I... I this is why I don't watch horror because I am way too committed yeah. um, to be able to watch something and detach myself to that level. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And as far as what Mark was saying about uh, Doctor Who as well, like I'm looking forward to watching the uh, the modern Doctor Who because I've not seen most of that. But at the rate I'm going, it'll be like four or five years before I get there because there's just so many. Um, just speaking to uh, what he was saying about the Runaway Bride episode and and Donna being his favourite uh, sidekick, or I don't know. Companion. Okay, companion, that's the one. Um, we saw Catherine Tate on Saturday. Mm. Um, we went to the Armageddon uh, convention. With that, our kids in here in Wellington. Yep, here in Wellington. Um affectionately nicknamed Welly Geddon. Mm. Um, and she was one of the speakers. Yeah. Um, and she walked right past us when we were sat in Which the... Which I did not notice. No, yeah. Mike had pointed out three times that she was talking in a panel discussion um, while I was negotiating with our son that, no, he was not going to be able to purchase a $3,000 furry wolf outfit. <laughs> And then we were sitting in this kind of chill out area in uh, where the um cosplayers were getting um it's where they go to do repairs and all on that their kind of stuff. And-, and she she was escorted directly past us and I was mouthing to Mike, Is Catherine Tate? And he was going, What? I can't hear you. You need to speak up. <laughs> you sound like I've got one of those gramophone <laughs> yeah. funnels in my well, ear. You were like, a bit like Can that. you speak up, laddie? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, it was fun. It was really fun. And as far as the Twin Peaks stuff goes, I mean, when I said, Oh, it's all, all killer from here on, I, I, I know that there's still season two ish stuff in here, but I feel like we're over the hump. Oh, yeah. You know, we're. we're, we're Basically, what we're saying is there's no Evelyn and James. You know, well, well there is. It, yeah, I know, but there's no like, oh god, we're well, back there's, here well, again. There's no episodes where you're going from scene to scene across four or five objectionable, yeah, storylines. You're not having someone launched into yeah. the sky from a but, cheerleading but, thing, but, yeah. but 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 also crucially, 
Windermere's turned up, so you've got a forward momentum. Yeah. That's that's what I mean. You've got the big bed. Yeah, is, is that you've actually got um, some coal in the engine, you yeah. know, um, moving things forward. So that's that's a positive thing. Yeah. Um, and you need to tell us, Mark, if you're keen to talk about season three or, you know, the return mm-hmm. with us at some point because yes. I think that's – really important yeah that'd be great all right well um what we're gonna do is we're gonna watch the uh 15th episode of season two of twin peaks and then we will um come back and tell you what we thought of said episode so should we do that now yep all right let's do it Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, and welcome to Film Bastards, a podcast where three friends, two of them married and two of them podcasting life partners, chat everything from new releases, trailers, news, and an eclectic mix of other film goodies. Oh, and many, many, many tangents. You can find them by searching your podcast provider or check them out on Twitter and Instagram by searching Film Bastards. You never know, you might like it. And if you don't, well, we don't really give a f- and we're back, so we've finished watching episode 15 of season 2 of Twin Peaks. Uh, do you have any initial thoughts, Hannah, before we get into the uh, breakdown of the episode? Um, I thought this was fairly solid, but I can't say that any one thing really grabbed me as being the thing that I was pleased to watch this episode for. Okay. Um, there were lots of, like, I'm, I... Like the conclusion of Ben's, you know, southern adventure, mm-hmm. shall we call it? Mm-hmm. Um, I uh, like the fact that all of the James and Evelyn shenanigans is kind of wrapping itself up. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, uh, delving a bit more into Wyndham Earl and, uh, you know, how he's enslaved Leo mm-hmm. um to work for him. The the items that you're shown to see where he's heading next for what he's prepared to do um was all interesting stuff. Um yeah I, I enjoyed it overall. I suppose for me um I think I probably didn't enjoy it quite as much as the last episode. Okay. Um but that doesn't mean it wasn't good. I just, it didn't connect with me just as much okay. as that. Anyway, what about you? Yeah. No, no, I, I largely agree. I think I liked it maybe a little bit more than you. I think I think the thing that this episode had going for it was it was the first time where it felt like there was actual filmmaking mm. happening. Like there was actually. Visually, it's really lovely. Like there was a sense of <clears throat> style to the mm. episode. And I think that, I mean, you mentioned the James Irvin and stuff. I actually quite enjoyed the James and Evelyn stuff in this episode. It's probably it, the only time it's quite compelling. Yeah, because it felt like they were there was actual interesting filmmaking going mm, on there. Yeah. Um and it actually genuinely felt Lynchian. It well, didn't mm. feel like it was trying to just be quirky, you know? Um and I also like the fact that it felt like the episode had um forward momentum. Mm. So whilst nothing really, like you say, jumps out or there was any real, you know, kind of punch the air moment, so to speak. It felt just like overall the quality was just a lot steadier Mm. and it felt like even the elements that weren't working in previous episodes felt better because there was actually a kind of an engine some style to it. Yeah, mm. but also from a storytelling perspective, mm, yeah. the fact that, that there's actual mystery and stakes. Mm, yeah. You know, it's not just um, a bunch of stuff happening. No. And it, it feels like, um, you know, they've kind of cleared the decks a little bit. Like a lot of storylines have ended. So it's very much, you can see that they're making room for the main storyline. Mm. And uh, I, yeah, I, I really enjoyed this episode. Well, should we get into the break there? Let's do it. Okay, let me just uh, find my notes. So so we open up on uh, a very Lynchian 
ominous shot of chess pieces. Um, I that liked... was really nice the way it goes through all those pieces and kind of focuses, doesn't it? It finishes on the queen, doesn't mm. it? Mm. It reminded me a lot of that shot much earlier in the season where they go in through that hole in the um, yeah. in the tiling in the wall. Yeah, It absolutely. felt a lot like that. And, and and actually, it's quite a bookend episode because it finishes on, on a visually striking yeah. um, image. And one of the Lynchian things that it does quite well is a couple of things is the use of sound, the use of dropping frames to give a weird stuttering effect to things, mm. um, but also the use of symmetry. Like there's a lot of symmetrical character movements and things in this episode. Well, like the lineup of... Um, Military men at the bar, yeah, all turning their and the head police at the same officers time. who walk out during the the scene mm-hmm. with Evelyn, yep. Uh, and I love the fact that because I, it always cracked me up that she pronounces Jaguar Jaguar Jaguar, Jaguar. and when the guy's spelling it, he's like J A G W A mm. the car because he's confused by their pronunciation of Jaguar as Jaguar, mm. you know. So he spells it phonetically, and I like the fact that they kind of call out that little sort of like affectation. Mm. Um, so we see the three cops in unison and we go over to Wally's and just the fact, again, the the kind of incongruity is very lynchy and the fact that there's opera mm-hmm. playing in this little hick bar where there'd probably be, you know, Garth Brooks yeah. playing or Joby, uh, you know, oh God, I can't remember his name, Toby Keith or somebody like that. And um, we, James and Donna are there and Donna calls Ed Um and there's that weird moment where that guy walks past and they all just go, hi, Frank, You're like, you know, all at yeah. once. And um, we see Bobby and Shelley go to see... Um, and Bobby, it's like he's regressed back to the pilot Yeah. Um, in his belligerence towards authority, um, authority yeah. and just being just a mega douche. Yeah, yeah, just uncooperative for, yeah. for the sake of it. And um, he tells them that Hank shot Leo. Um, I love the fact that Albert is just like, yeah, I like punk. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <He's been> <laughs> and and, he, and he, I like the way that, that um, Albert... I love how they embrace. Well, it's as though since Albert's declaration of love, you know, in the earlier episode where yeah. he, he talks about how, you know, the basis of his work is love. It's like he's just, he can't go back now. And But I think also there's... There's a lot of mutual respect there because they kind of had fisticuffs as well. Well, also, they've been through something together. Yeah. You know, they, yeah. they, they, they went through them. all of the kind mm-hmm. of craziness. Yeah. We see when he shows them, when Albert shows them the map of Wyndham's um, route. It's mm. a big sea. It's a sea. It's for, a sea. For, for Cooper, yeah. you know. Not sea for cat? No, well, probably not. Um, I like as well that... Albert calls out Cooper's fashion suicide, as he calls it, you know, yeah. with the uh, the going rustic. Um, we see Wyndham Earl uh, learning about Leo's uh, rap sheet as well, and he's kind of wearing long it's johns. Terrible, and, dirty long johns. Yeah. And um, he puts like a kind of like a low jack on Leo, to, a zapper to um, control him. So I always thought it was do. like a elect- electronic like those um electrified dog collars you know that like the behavioral ones that they have that you could like they have like a perimeter on them and if yeah, the yeah. Dog like, that's too what it far is. away and yeah mm. it's zapped yeah like they, they use them for like a version therapy for uh for, for animals and um i mean sound horrible uh, well, yeah, and um, we see Ed and Norma in bed. Not so much kissing, I bet you're relieved about this, this scene really made me laugh because, honestly, like, Ed starts off like, oh, terrible, 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 terrible. And then the camera pans over to Norma and, oh, more terrible for me, more terrible for me, more terrible for me. Back to Ed. No, definitely more terrible for me, terrible, terrible, more terrible for me. Back to Norma, so definitely I win. More terrible for me. And then Nadine comes in and just Rips the door gets off. into bed with them, doesn't find that strange in the slightest, and you're sitting there thinking, no, most terrible for her, really. Yeah. Yeah. She's lost an eye. 
she has regressed back to a high school self. She's got so much adrenaline coursing through her mm. body she can't open a door normally. And she's talking to her husband and his mistress just after they've shagged. Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter how you – like, I want Ed and Norma to be together. No, but, also, but, 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 but Nadine has been horribly controlling and abusive to Ed for the last 20 years of his life as yes. well. But Nobody has done well out of that relationship. No, but you can't help but feel for her. Oh, yeah. I mean, particularly as she has regressed to being a child, you know. Yeah. I mean, she was going to kill herself at the end of the last exactly. season. Exactly. You know. Because because she knows how awful she's become. It's like she's become controlling and, you know, holding it back because she knows. Well, she knows he's only married to her out of pity. Yeah. You know, and the, that's not the, the, enough. Her, her lack of of sight in one eye is is a reminder every day that that's the only reason he's married Yeah, yeah, yeah. But she needs to find something for herself. Yeah. You know, that's the thing. But she's not going to be able to do it at the moment because she's insane. No, absolutely. You know, so, so, I mean, that's not helping the situation. Um, She tells him about her and Mike. Uh, We see Cooper and Truman go to see Josie and uh, question her about uh, Jonathan, her, her assistant who was killed. We see uh, Eckert call her. We get a bit more business with Ben. We, I like that. we see Johnny Horn again for the first time since early in the oh. first season, replete with his uh, native uh, cultural Do appropriation. Do you ever see um, Ben Horn's wife ever again? There yes. Was, there was do. that one episode where they had dinner. Um. And she has been in it a couple of other times since then, just like with, with, with uh, but I mean, very early on. She's in it again. She's in the final episode, actually, of, right. of season two. Um, so we um, we see Jerry being an opportunist and basically talking to Audrey about, well, you know, I've got a few interesting projects I'd like to be able to push through. And she's just like, no, you know. She, I love how she shuts them down. Yeah, she just kind of like, you know, just, uh, you know. Had enough of this here. crap, yeah. And um, we see that they've got like a cast of, people involved like some confused looking employees from the uh from the hotel are there um we see donna go to see evelyn and i like that scene as well where donna's kind of saying to her you know she comes across as naive but she's right she's like you just like to make everything seem pointless and stupid you know Mm. and it's kind of it's not big and it's not clever Mm. i uh, actually that's just reminded me when james and donna at the bar previously when when before she rings Ed um and he's saying to her I know I can talk around I'll I'll you know I know she'll listen to me and and her kind of making that connection that okay well they've obviously shared had a relationship um and just that sort of understated upset that yeah. that causes her yeah it was nice to see an understated reaction to it because donna as a character is quite over the top and dramatic. dramatic so it was nice to kind of like see her go i don't have time to deal with that part of it at the yeah, moment but also that it's it's um it it's it's a big enough effect on her that that is almost too big for her to process yeah um, I I just I thought it was really well done. And mentioning that scene, actually, I forgot to say at the time that one nice little Lynchian touch is the the barman who keeps asking her if she wants anything. Yeah, and he keeps popping back, and just that kind of weird um, over overstepping of boundaries mm. that you see quite a lot in in Lynch films, like characters just being kind of like bothersome. Yeah. We see that uh, we learn about the transient's name was Powell, uh, which was a Caroline's maiden name. We learn that Pete is a great chess player. So Cooper goes to him about, look, can you help us play a, ga- a defensive game? Mm. So we're going to minimise uh, the amount of players that we lose. Mm-hmm. And again, we're seeing the show figuring out how to use the characters. It's yeah. like, right, we've got this great ensemble. Let's give them stuff to do. You know, mm. um, So they're kind of seeding mm-hmm. that a little bit. Um, Harry goes to talk to Norma um, about Hank and Shelley goes back and asks to work at the diner again. I love their conversation while 
um, Norma's dusting a giant ice cream. Which is yeah, which you see her walking really around with earlier in the <laughs> yeah. episode as well. And I like how just over it, Norma is like, Truman's like, look, he's going to go to prison this time. She's like, good. Yeah, there's Whatever. no pretense about, yeah. oh, yeah. it's my husband. Yeah, yeah. She's just like, fuck, just dead to her. fuck that guy. Um, and there's one thing as well that this episode does that nearly every episode of Twin Peaks does at some point, but I've not mentioned, and it's just so tremendously simple and effective, is the use of that that first part of the Laura Palmer theme, that kind of ominous synth, you know, the night music, mm. that used at night time is just so effective. Yeah, of course you it know. is. Um, and it's a card that the show pulls a lot, but every time they do it, it works. And mm. there's something about the combination of those chords and nighttime that is just pure cinema and mm. that is just pure filmmaking and that they really struck upon that. Yeah. Um, and um, we see Eckhart go to see Catherine. Uh, they are going to have a dinner of a giant pig head <laughs> for some yeah. reason. Mm, I mean, that's a yum. scheming bastard's meal, if ever I yeah, saw one. Yeah, it really actually. is. And again, the filmmaking with all the Evelyn stuff works so much better. Like, you've got her in the um, blowing smoke rings in slow motion with jazz music playing. It just, it just elevates. Yeah. And I like the fact that when James goes to see her, she's just, like, trying to burst his naive bubble. She's like, look, you know, do you want me to say that he was beating me or that I did it for love. She's like, I did it for the money and because I wanted to, you know, there's no romantic. I think, I think also there's an element of wanting to put him off. Yeah. Like, like feeling guilty for having made him fall for her. Yeah. And I think like a lot of characters in Twin Peaks, I think like Ben, for example, and, and, and Catherine, maybe deep down there's, there's the, not necessarily goodness, but just the memory of goodness, the memory mm. of being good. Um, but they've got so used to the scheming. Like you see it later in the episode when her co-conspirator gives her this bullshit story. And when she kills him, you can see her immediately formulating it. And yeah. go, he came in, he did this. It's like th th these are characters that have lived in this world of subterfuge for so long, mm. but it's just their oxygen and they, they, yeah. they, that's how they operate. Yeah. And even though... There is this inner light or whatever you want to call it. like, And you do see that with Evelyn. I think it is genuine, you know, when mm. she's saying to James, look, just get out of here, you know, you're, you're pure you're and honest good. and, and yeah. I didn't think that existed anymore mm. and I want to know that that's somehow mm. preserved and alive yeah. out there. Yeah. And I think that's genuine. But ultimately, she has to protect herself. Well, she's self-serving. Yeah, because yeah. that's just how she lives. And, you, and there's a lot of that in Twin Peaks. He's, you know, the, the story she's given is, you know, say that he broke in and that you shot him and you shot him till he was dead. Mm. And I like the way that we keep cutting back to this image of her in this veil, mm. seeing this fake mourning. We get the cosplay Civil War. And I think it's perfect as well because Sherilyn Fenn has the look of, like, Vivian Lee. Yes, yeah, she um, does. And Elizabeth Taylor and actresses who you would see in that kind of garb mm. in, in films of the era. Um, and I love the fact that it's like a shit school play, isn't it? It basically. really is, yeah. Um, and um, But Richard Beamer, you know, he plays it straight. He plays it with the same level of commitment that he plays any of, the, of his roles Bob, in Twin Bobby Peaks. with the, the bugle, bugle is just <laughs> the funniest bit of And it. I love the way that the prop horse whinnies yeah. as well. I mean, that's such a kind of – I can imagine them when they were doing ADR being like, is that too much? Should, should we do that? <laughs> oh, screw it. Let's just do it. Yeah. Um, and we see him, quote, win the war and collapse. And it's funny because obviously it's trying to evoke the Wizard of Oz. Mm. You know, I had this dream and you were there and you were there. And of course, David Lynch's fascination with the Wizard of Oz is very well known. You know, Wild at Heart is like a loose remake of, of the Wizard of Oz. There's a documentary that's just come out called Lynch Oz, but it's like a two hour documentary just about. Um, David Lynch uh, goes to Australia. Is that yeah, what it yeah, is? yeah. <laughs> Davo, <laughs> Lynchho. No, but um, Lynch that's what it would be called if we'd have made it, wouldn't Lynch we? Just, um, but um, it's it's about um, just how allusions to the Wizard of Oz in his movies. Um, but of course, this episode wasn't directed by David Lynch. But I like one of the things that I like about the approach of this episode is that 
it's almost trying to be influenced by the same things that David Lynch was influenced by, as opposed to trying to be influenced by David Lynch. And that, and you see that in other things, and that's what it works. Like Star Wars, people have always tried to emulate what George Lucas did, never succeeded until Dave Filoni and John Favreau said, no, you don't emulate George Lucas, you emulate Kurosawa, mm. because that was who George Lucas was emulating, yeah. and then it will feel like Star Wars. Yeah. You know, you've got to almost kind of skip a generation. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I feel like that's what's happening in this episode, is the fact that Diane Keaton seems influenced by photography and uh, Fellini and mm. uh, Truffaut, as opposed to being direct uh, directly influenced by David Lynch, which mm. ends up making it feel more genuinely Lynchian than some of these other filmmakers who just have people doing mad shit because yeah. David Lynch is weird. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, I had such a brain fart moment then. I went off on a absolute internal tangent about um, maybe the song isn't is 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 about a man called Mel Yell instead of Mellow Yellow. <laughs> it could be. Is it an Australian band who sing that song? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, well, I mean, it's a bit of a um, Holy Ghosties kind of, uh, <laughs> yeah. kind of scenario, isn't I'm it? I'm going to think about that. It's about a man called Mr. <laughs> Mel Yell. So, um, Sorry, that is completely unconnected. We, we, uh, well, you know, it's, it's, it's all stream of consciousness, isn't it? Uh, we see uh, Windermill putting on one of his disguises, which I don't think is actually a terrible disguise. Really. No, no, it's right. Um, we see him, um, you know, we see the Queen. We see Donna run in to try and save save James, and Evelyn shoots Malcolm, and she like she immediately starts recounting um, her alibi or yeah. practicing her alibi. I kind of love the fact that Donna just just runs in there like guns no be plan. damned. She's yeah. just like, please don't hurt him. Yeah, yeah, mm. and um, we see Windermill drop off a note for Audrey, mm. and I like the little touch where he's like, "Oh, owls." And you're yeah. like, oh, okay, that is, what's, there's got to be a... And it's like they've got a postcard rack that's just... With the shittest photo it's of just an all, owl It's ever. just all owls, isn't it? It's yeah, but to... it's not even a good photo. It's literally the eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we see... I like the way that Cooper looks at his suit. Yeah. Hanging, like, he's not wearing it, but he's still meticulously, you know, keeping... Because um, he knows sooner or later he's going to have to wear it. Soon, my pretty. Soon. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, soon. Um, there's a mask, uh, like a sort of death mask mm-hmm. in his um, in his bed and a message from Windermere saying, your move. Uh, so any final thoughts, Hannah, before you tell us what we are talking about next time? Um, no, I just think, I think it was a solid episode and I think, um, you know, it's like we've said, it's just, it's all good stuff going forward. So I, I just feel... I feel like when we start watching an episode, I sort of forget the world around me, and all I'm in is is Twin Peaks. Yeah, yeah, it's, it is definitely um, a, a spell, and, and which I think, is kind of a lovely feeling. There are not a lot of shows in this world that do that to you. And the thing is, it's it's odd, it's odd because it's not necessarily a comforting thing because the world of Twin Peaks can be a oh, frightening, weird frightening, place. Yeah, um, but but it is very immersive. But like. To the in this episode, to the point where there were a couple of times I was saying, "Shit, I've got to talk about this in a minute." Like I was just so like meandering along with what was Lava happening lumping. and just yeah, just having a lovely time, yeah. and then forgetting the fact that oh no no, like keep your wits about you well, because I mean, you've got to talk about it. <laughs> it's a dream, isn't it? And there's something kind of just naturally soporific, yeah, about very that, much you so. Know? Um, but um, cool. Okay, quick reminder that we appreciate feedback at rewatchprojectpodcast at gmail.com. We are at rewatchproj on Twitter and on Instagram. Check out our friend shows, comments on the YouTube channel, greatly appreciated, as our reviews on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. So, what are we talking about next time, Hannah? The next episode is called The Condemned Woman. Um, Truman puts Hank in prison for the attempted murder of Leo while Hank points the finger at Josie for the murder of Andrew Packard. Albert reveals that Josie shot Cooper. Ben enlists the help of John Justice Wheeler. Alrighty, okay. It is directed by Leslie Linker-Glatter, 
and written by Trisha Brock. All right, gosh, so written by a woman, directed by a woman. Indeed. And uh, we will be back with you very soon. Goodbye. See ya.